Okay, you can please stop this one. Okay, we can go live, please. Uh, if you can share with me, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, today we will have uh, a very interesting topic, uh, and it will be one before the last sessions or last episode of EVITS Week in Knowledge. And also we are having today Dr. Deepak Sharma uh, to have a presentation about anterior segment. Uh, so, the first topic, it will be by uh, Deepak Sharma. He's a specialist ophthalmologist, cornea and refractive surgeon, uh, Emirates Health Group in Dubai. And he is going to talk about lubricant in ocular surface, ascient view. And then we will have Dr. Ahmed Salam, and he will give the episode talk about the uh, uveitis management as an episode nine of UVITIS Weekly Knowledge. Dr. Ahmed Salam is Associate Professor Retina and UVITIS Director, UVITIS Service, Jones Eye Institute, University of Arkansas for Medical Science, Arkansas, USA. So I will give the floor for Dr. Dibak to start his presentation, Dr. Dibak. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you, uh, Dr. Amri, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, to take part in this wonderful uh, webinar. I'll be sharing my uh, screen. Uh, I hope I'm visible, sir. Yes, everything is good. Yeah, please. Okay. Can go. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll be speaking today uh, and giving a succinct view on the impact of lubricants on the ocular surface. So uh, as we all know, a fully functioning lacrimal film is necessary for the maintenance of ocular health and for the proper interaction between the structures of the ocular surface. An ideal lacrimimatic, as we call them, uh, must provide an environmental compatible with the maintenance of the ocular physiology and must support the epithelial healing. Lubricants must also accommodate the necessity of intermittent installation while aiming to mimic the continued production of the natural tears. Uh, viscosity agents are also included in these formulations in order to increase the contact time of the drop with the ocular surface. As per the FDA monograph, the active ingredients uh, component of these lubricant formulations are divided into basically two types. Uh, they could be uh, ophthalmic demulsins or ophthalmic emollients. Ophthalmic demulsins are agents which are usually water-soluble polymers which are applied topically to the eye to protect and lubricate the mucous membranes. They could be cellulose derivatives, uh, dextrans, gelatins, or the polyols. And then there are ophthalmic emollients, which are agents, which are usually fat or oil uh, components applied locally to the eyelids to protect and soften tissues and to prevent drying and cracking. They could be lanolin preparations, uh, or the oligenous ingredients such as the mineral oils, the uh, white wax, and the petrolatums. The most common used active ingredients among the lubricants are either the cellulose derivatives, the sodium hyaluronates, the synthetic polymers, the HP guards, or the glycerins. And to start with the cellulose derivatives, these are the polysaccharides with good ocular surface retention time and lubricant action. They are non-irritants that can be used in association with other ophthalmic formulations. The most commonly used agent are the carboxymethyl cellulose uh, in the available commercial formulations. They have desirable mucoadhesive and viscoelastic properties and a high retention time on the ocular surface. 
They can be used in the concentration of 0.25, 0.5, or 1% with different molecular weights. They, they, are, uh, they have the ability to stimulate the cellular migration, which have, has been established in in vitro and animal model studies. Uh, concentration higher than 1% can cause blurring of vision and secretion of sticky material in humans, but that this too provides a higher retention time on the ocular surface and hence require fewer daily installations. Then comes the hypromellose, another cellulose derivative, which is also viscoelastic polysaccharide with good retention properties, but it has a disadvantage of encrusting the eyelids, which may mimic nephritis in humans. Moving on to the sodium hyaluronate, which is a glycosaminoglycan present in natural tears with excellent viscoelastic, lubricating, and water retention property. It has a high retention time on the ocular surface. It promotes epithelial cell migration, thus supporting the epithelial healing. There is also an evidence that sodium hyaluronate has a direct role in ocular inflammation and in cellular adhesion and migration. A combination of uh, carboxymethyl cellulose and sodium hyaluronate and has high viscosity under low friction condition, that is between blinking, thus stabilizing the tear film, but it has low viscosity under high friction condition, that is the during the blink. That does it cause lesser adverse effects such as discomfort in humans. Studies have shown that combination of CMC and sodium hyaluronate is uh, well tolerated with better treatment outcomes, causing less adverse effects when compared to single polymers. Synthetic polymers uh, most commonly used are the carbomers or the polymers. The carbomers are polymers with a high viscosity and a good retention time, but it can cause intense blurring. Povidones are linear polymers with mucinomimetic properties and good retention time. They are often added to the cellulose based solutions to supplement both the aqueous and mucin layer of the tear film or to the polyvinyl alcohol solutions to increase the wetting of the ocular surface. Then comes the HP GUA, which are used in combination with the PEG 400 or the PG molecules as a gelling agent. They adapt to the abnormalities of the lacrimal film and alteration on the ocular surface. Ophthalmic formulation uh, includes sorbitol as well as borate. When stored at a pH of 7, the sorbitol binds to the borate. But once it's instilled in the eye where the pH is around 7.5, the link between sorbitol and borate is dissociated and the HBG in turns, the, the HP guar in turns binds to the borate and forms gel with bioadhesive properties, thus increasing the duration of exposure to the active ingredients. Then moving on to the lipid ointments, they are alternative to the viscosity polymers just discussed. Uh, they, they, they are used to lubricate the ocular surface and supplement the lipid layer of the tear film. They increase the lacrimal stability and overcome the limitations of the retention time. They are indicated in, uh, in the cases of uh, severe evaporative KCS. Uh, commonly used are the petrolatums and the mineral oils. Uh, however, lanolinyl preparations are also used in some cases, but uh, they are known to cause irritation and, and retard the regeneration of the corneal epithelium. Uh, bacterial growth is limited in, in lipid ointment uh, compositions and therefore mostly do not require the use of preservatives. And when we talk about preservatives, they, they are the molecules which are added to the formulations to prevent contamination in the bottle, which may, may cause severe ocular infections. They are highly toxic to the ocular surface when chronically used and may worsen the inflammation and disease. While this toxicity is dose dependent, even the low concentration reported in, in the commercial products can cause deleterious effects. Although less toxic uh, preservatives has been developed, but none are completely non-toxic. There are basically three types of preservatives, the detergents, the oxidative, and the ionic buffering system. The detergents cause bacterial cell death by interrupting with the lipids in their cell membranes, this causing the cells to break apart. They are very toxic to the human cells and have a, has a very broad spectrum of action. Oxidative uh, preservatives penetrate the bacterial cell membrane and damage their DNAs, the proteins, and the lipids. They are, however, less toxic to the human cells than the detergent preservatives. Effective against bacteria at very low concentration, which helps to minimize the damage. And lastly are the ionic buffering systems, which are similar to the oxidative preservatives, but have both the antibacterial and antifungal properties.
Uh, most commonly used preservatives are uh, the BAKs, the polyquarts, sodium perborates, uh, the stabilized oxyfluoro complex, the purides, Occupure, the PHMBs, the chlorobutanols, and the EDTAs. BAKs is the, uh, are the most commonly used preservatives in the last few decades, and it's extremely toxic to the conjunctival and coil cells. Chronic use causes, uh, destabilizes the tear film and affects the intercellular junctions and the cellular morphology. They're also known to reduce the goblet cell density, thus affecting the mucin layer and can eventually cause apoptosis and epithelial desquamation. Toxicity, however, is dependent on concentration, the frequency of administration, the severity of the ocular disease, and the level of necrimine secretion. So, the worst effects are seen in the KCS patients due to high exposure of the molecule to the corneal epithelium and the low volume of uh, the tears available to dilute the drug. There is an also an evidence that BAK, which is also found in the eye drops for glaucoma, can penetrate the globe and affect the tubercular meshwork. The polyquads are uh, the quaternary ammonium compounds. Uh, they are detergents similar to the BAKs, but its toxicity is restricted to its high molecular weight, which limits the epithelial cell penetration, thereby reducing the damage to the lacrimal film and the ocular surface. The sodium perborate, uh, perborates have antibacterial action with minimum toxicity. Uh, sodium perborate dissolves in water and releases hydrogen peroxide, which when in contact with the ocular surface is converted into water, chlorine, and oxygen. However, the hydrogen peroxide, even which is produced at lower concentration, may injure the ocular surface. The stabilized oxychloro complex or the puride is a mixture of oxychloro species that has antifungal, antibacterial, as well as antiviral action. The mechanism of action of puride is the release of chlorine dioxide in the acidic microbial environment and its interference with the microbial protein synthesis. When in contact with the lacrimal film, it's converted into natural tear components such as water, oxygen, sodium, and chlorine. It has mild cytotoxic effects, good tolerance, and excellent safety record. In a clinical trial, uh, puride had considerably minor effects. Uh, however, it has been shown to cause superficial punctate corneal fluorescent stain. Osmoprotectants are another set of molecules that are added to the lubricants. They help to neutralize the damage caused by hyperosmolarity in patients with KCS. They have antioxidant action, stabilization of protein surfaces, and they cause restoration of cellular molecules. The most commonly used uh, components are the erythritols, glycerol, L-carnitine, or betaine. L-carnitine and erythritol protect the corneal cells against the osmotic stress. Betaine, on the other hand, suppresses the expression, production, and activation of metalloproteinases, which are the enzymes responsible for tissue remodeling. And control of metalloproteinase expression is definitely desirable as their production is increased in hyperosmotic environment which can lead to corneal ulcers and melting. Now, since most of the corneal changes occur when the preservative reach high concentration, if one chooses to use a TA supplement with preservative, daily use should be limited to four to six times a day. Uh, due to risk of contamination, if a preservative-free tear drop is chosen, single dose vials are recommended over multi-dose. However, the increased cost is definitely another downside. So the choice between the preservative free and the preserved tears should be a point of discussion between the doctor and the patient. Now, regarding the methodology of use of lubricants in dry eye, in 2014, Moshifer et al. presented a literature review which divided the use of uh, lubricants into three steps. Step one, step two, and step three. Uh, I'll be coming back on that. Uh, so based on the duration and frequency of artificial tear use reported in all the studies that was referenced by Moshifer et al. in his study in 2014, a mean dose of 3.47 doses per day over a period of 60.1 days was established. So to be precise, the recommendation would be to use the artificial tears three to four times a day over a period of two months and then transition into the next step. That means, so when a patient uh, of dry eye uh, is uh, 
comes to us, then we need to start with step one, which is divided into three category of drops. One can start with a CMC base or an HPMC base or a hyaluronic acid base molecule. If the, uh, this is to be used for three to four times a day for a period of uh, 60 days, if the patient is refractory to treatment, we need to move to step two by introducing a PEG 400 or a PG or a glycerin molecule. If the symptoms are still persisting, uh, especially in cases of severe dis uh, dysfunctional tear syndrome or the lid malposition or exposure cardiopathy, then the implementation of additional uh, therapies in the step three, such as gels, ointments or sprays should be advocated. So uh, if artificial tears are to be used beyond four to six times a day, then a preservative free formulation should be used. That's the recommendation. Now, not only dry eye lubricants are, are used in plethora of conditions across the OSD spectrum and clinical scenarios. So it could be microbial keratitis, uh, reconstitution of antimicrobials, allergic conjunctivitis, the viral infections, contact lens induced ocular surface uh, disease, psychiatricial conjunctivitis, chemical and thermal injuries, exposure cardiopathies, conin persistent epithelial defects, the delens, and the list is endless. So I would be discussing a few clinical scenarios in which uh, uh, the use of lubricants came in handy in the management of the patients. So the case one is an eight-year-old boy presented to us with multiple episodes of redness, watering, photophobia since long time, right eye more than the left eye, on treatment with topical medications off and on. Now, evaluation in the right eye showed inferior conin penis with abnormally, abnormal overlying epithelium, probably due to a partial limbal stem cell deficiency secondary to a long-standing allergic eye disease. So child was started with conservative treatment on topical steroids in uh, varying uh, potency and strength. And finally, when the, uh, the active episode was controlled, the child was maintained on the therapy with cyclosporin and preservative free lubricants. The child is doing well with no recurrences noted so far. So the take-home message was to start topical steroids with the first evidence of limbitis in cases of allergic eye disease. The case two is a 39-year-old gentleman, a case of lung carcinoma, presents to us with redness right eye with no other symptom. He was started on fatinib by his treating oncologist. The dermatology consultation showed oral and skin eruptions. Orthal examination revealed a temporal conjunctival and epistate congestion with epithelial denudation and the underlying sclera having a muddy appearance. The rest of the ocular examination was within normal limits. So a clinical impression diagnosis of acute Stephen Johnson syndrome-like drug reaction to ofatinib was concluded. The treatment in the form of stopping the offending drug, first of all, by the oncologist and starting topical steroids, antibiotics, and copious lubrication. The patient fortunately recovered well, highlighting the importance of timely diagnosis with multidisciplinary approach. So a take-home message would be a timely diagnosis in such cases can prevent visual disaster. A third case is a 28-year-old female that presents to us with recurrent episodes of pain watering in the right eye. She had a fingernail injury many months back. Uh, examination revealed a large central epithelial loosening in cell barrier. She was diagnosed with recurrent corneal erosion syndrome in the right eye. Uh, she underwent superficial keratectomy with Bowman's uh, uh, polishing, Bowman's membrane polishing with diamond bud, uh, followed by topical medications in the form of low dose steroid and preservative free lubrication. And uh, she hasn't reported any recurrence so far. So the take home message would be a uh, Bowman's membrane polishing has a role in recurrent cases, and keeping the lubricants on in such cases helps to prevent. Uh, recurrences and keep the patient symptom free. The fourth case is a six year old boy presents with an accidental splash of sanitizer in the left eye three days back. Eye was patched as the time of presentation and was using topical medication in the form of antibiotics and lubricants. So, emergency care uh, was provided elsewhere at the time of injury as per the mother. Uh, evaluation uh, with us showed large circumferential peripheral conjunctival denudation with large corneal ED, with one clock hour of labial ischemia in Firunesi. Uh, the child was uh, started on topical steroids, antibiotics and lubricants, and was uh, after application of a large diameter bandage contact lens. 
the child did well and uh, with complete recovery of his optic surface. So the take home message again here is that to start topical steroid in all cases of chemical injuries within that group. Uh, the fifth case is a 42 year old gentleman with facial palsy leading to lack of thermos and exposure keratopathy. It was operated case of brain tumor. He had a relatively good balance, but in field coronary exposure, he did tell information. Now he presents with redness pain watering since last three days to us and examination reveals a corneal tendon with cellularity due to exposure keratopathy. He was on and off lubricants. Uh, we started uh, with conservative treatment with topical steroids, antibiotics and lubrication. With nocturnal retable, the dialin healed well with no recurrent episode so far. We kept plan B of tarsolepsy if the patient was not responsive. The take home message is a small inapparent exposure keratopathy in such cases could be detrimental and therefore need urgent intervention. Uh, the case six is a 32 year old gentleman presents with right eye watering pain and redness since last 10 days on topical antibiotics and was referred for further management. Uh, he, he was a case of cornean intacts, which was done in the same eye many years back as he had keratoconus. So examination with us revealed a round shape epithelial defect with dense infiltrate and cellularity involving the roof of the inferior intact stomach, which is clearly seen here, uh, which was still preserved, right? So uh, this case required a careful scraping which was definitely a challenge because of the risk of uh, severing the thin roof of the intact tunnel, and that could lead to infection spillover. But everything went well, and based on the reports, a uh, patient was started on fortified drops, and which was prepared with, prepared with lubricants. Now, preparation of the drops, uh, the fortification of the medication was done with lubricants because of uh, two reasons. One, it is uh, the patient is very comfortable, and patient uh, accepts frequent installation of the drops. Uh, and the other is that it has a dual action that antibiotics is also provided as well as the lubricant effect is also achieved by the patient. So therefore we prefer fortifying the drops with lubricants rather than distilled water. So in this case too, the patient did well and healed with minimal scarring. So to conclude, Lubricants are part of every ocular surface therapy that we, we initiate or come across, may it be as primary or as adjunct. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dibak, for this uh, comprehensive and excellent presentation with good cases presentation also to demonstrate and also to take home message from that cases. Um, uh, just one question. Uh, uh, you, you use um, cyclosporine in children. Uh, did you change the percentage? Because I saw the percentage is the same or different and how you use it. Yeah, sir. I, uh, in this case, I used 0.1% cyclosporine drop uh, because the patient could arrange it uh, from back home from India. And I prefer using a 0.1% uh, in, uh, especially in such cases of allergic eye disease who would need uh, for longer installation rather than a 0.05%, which is normally available, especially in such uh, cases of AIDS. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dibak, for this uh, excellent presentation. Thank and you. now we move to Dr. Ahmed Salam with the uh, Episode 9 of Uveitis Weekly Knowledge and Management of Uveitis. Uh, Dr. Ahmad, the floor for you, please. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed, and thank you, Dr. Sharma, for the excellent presentation. Um, let me just share my slides.
Okay, so uh, again, thank you so much for the kind invitation. So I'll be speaking um, quickly on the management of UVitis and most of the UVitis uh, presentations that uh, was before this presentation covered on the management for each specific disease. But let me go through certain um, aspects of UVitis and just try to collectively gather some uh, thoughts about UVitis. So, okay. For treatment of anterior uveitis, we know that drops are usually very good and it's not, it's very efficient. Uh, patients, when they have complications, most important will be cystoid macro edema. Only about 30 to 50% of the, those patients with macro edema in relation to anterior uveitis would respond only to topical steroid drops. The majority would need something more hardcore, and that's usually an orbital floor injection of steroid or a periocular steroid. You can give oral, you can give intravitreal, but usually you need to do something else, and we'll come to that. Okay, so for treatment of anterior uveitis, what should we do? And this uh, diagram here from a focal point that we wrote, and I'll pass that focal point to Dr. Uh, Muhammad Al Amri, and he can pass to you all. Uh, the, the thing is, you treat them, always treat patients with six weeks course of steroid drops. Uh, if you give less than this, they don't get uh, in remission and the chance that they get chronic inflammation becomes high. Then after the six weeks treatment, you want to see what happens to this patient as you stop the drops, whether they flare up. And if they flare up, is it less than three months or more than three months after stopping the drops? And this is so crucial because it tells you if this is a recurrent acute anterior uveitis, I'm talking about the left side of the flow chart here, or it's chronic, and if it's recurrent acute, then they just need the same treatment again. If it's chronic, it's completely a different ball game because the reason they are uh, flaring up is because you're stopping the steroid drops and they need longer uh, term uh, treatment at a lower frequency. For example, once a day, you know, twice a day for a few months, once a day for a few months. So those are those patients. Okay, what if patient is not responding to therapy? Well, you can go down the route of oral prednisone and very rarely in adults uh, go immunosuppression, but this is very rare. So here I would stop and just really like reflect more on what's happening because this could be a case of a fuchsiterochromic uveitis that you're just treating unnecessarily or you're missing a herpetic anterior uveitis. So what would tell you that this is a herpetic anterior uveitis? So high pressure, iris changes, cornea changes. And then if you're suspecting that, get an AC tap and send for viral PCR. And we had loads, of, not lots, we had several cases like this that uh, did so well after uh, adding to the steroids, the topic of steroids, antiviral treatment. So that's what I wanted to touch on in the anterior uveitis. Okay. Let's go through systemic treatment. Let me tell you this patient, Mrs. Fatakat. Uh, Mrs. Fatakat is a 55-year-old female from London, and she had left pan uveitis with severe vitritis and cystoid macroedema. She had all the blood tests, system review, everything is negative, and we reached to the conclusion that this is a site uh, involving uh, uveitis which is um, non-infectious and is undifferentiated. So we need to regather those points. So uh, it's non-infectious because we exclude infection. Uh, it's undifferentiated because we cannot, we did not reach to a single cause. And it's, we need to know if this is, pan, for example, patients may have pan but it's really not site involving, it may be like very mild site threatening or even not site threatening, then you may would just watch them. But this one is site involving, so it means it needs treatment. Okay, so what are we gonna do? So uh, the my boss you, uh, always said that it's like a cookery. You can go to a restaurant, they feed you, and then you can go to another restaurant, they feed you another thing, but you're still happy. Same can happen here in uveitis. You can be treated with local treatment, be treated with systemic treatment, it may vary. So that's something you need to understand. Okay, so uh, what's the advantage and disadvantage of treatment with um, systemic treatment? So treatment with systemic treatment, you have no problem with the eye. 
uh, but you can have problem to the rest of the of the body, right? But this is more suitable if you have systemic disease, if you have bilateral disease. While a unilateral case, for example, uh, may be more suitable for uh, more of a local intravitreal treatment, and also cases that are um, flaring up, especially those with macular edema, on systemic treatment. So you may want that as a bridging treatment or as an adjuvant treatment to systemic treatment. And again, I think it varies from one person to another. And a UVI to specialist need to be comfortable with the management of both and discuss that with both patients. Okay. Uh, okay. So I said, this is very a very simple way. I like this diagram a lot because it makes UVI to very easy to understand. And you can really hear, if you look to this, beautiful simplified diagram you can just understand everything about uveitis what do you feel how do you feel do you like that slide is it uh, simple enough very simple dr ahmed very simple yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you know i like simple well, that's why i brought that slide okay well forget about it we have re really here is the uh, easier way the antigen presenting cell you get reactivation of the t cell you get transcription factor production of pro inflammatory protein for example interleukin 2 t cell expansion dna and rna synthesis the b cell the t cells also activates the macrophages and uh, the uh, that activate the B cells. And if you think about that, you can now go ahead and put the where the medications work. And this is more than enough to know really how medications work. Okay, uh, I think the most important thing really in treatment of systemic uveitis, once you know it's infectious or non-infectious, is to employ common sense, right? Fact, this is a, a, a like a very important fact. The most one of the most effective treatment, if not really the most effective, is corticosteroid. Steroids is a magic treatment. The problem is the side effect. So short-term and a small-dose steroid is really a magic treatment. So basically, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to treat the patient with systemic steroids unless we know that this is a condition that is going to continue a long time or it's a condition where you really need other medications because it's a very serious condition. For example... Um, for example, sorry, let me just see. For example, okay, what are serious disease? Bear shot, you need medications from the word go other than steroid. Uh, Bechet disease, right? Uh, sympathetic ophthalmia, VKH uh, to a very certain extent, serpiginous choroiditis, uh, centrally involved in retinal vasculitis. And the last one is uh, ocular stick atresia, pemphigoid. Those diseases you really need to start, as you start the steroids, you know, these are diseases that are not very uh, simple to manage. And from the word go, you need a second line immunosuppressant. Okay, so let's say we have, we, we have another, like not one of those diseases we discussed. So what are we trying to do? We try to start steroid with a very high dose and taper down gradually. In maybe two to three months, we stop the steroid and see what happens. Okay, so what if the patient flares up, right? Okay, is the patient flaring up on a small dose? And we can really we'll come and discuss that small dose. Yes, okay, then we can just keep them on that small dose for a long time and make sure we can control for the side effects of um, steroids. For example, osteoporosis is the most important side effects. So these patients, they need to have a bone density scan, they need to have calcium, vitamin D, and as directed by the bone density scan, they may need to have bisphosphonates. So what's that dose that is really well tolerated? Textbooks used to say 10 milligram. Now it's saying 7.5 milligram, but in reality, really 7.5 milligram, they still get side effects. They get cushionoid. Five milligrams seems to be the right dose. So I wanted to, to remind us, five milligram per kg is a nice dose. They can live with it. But you really have to do your due diligence and get things organized for these patients. So get them with the primary care physician, speak to the primary care physician about bone prophylaxis, uh, as we discussed. This is so important. You're really doing these patients a favor. Okay, let's say that the patient is flaring up. 
at a higher dose, then they really need something called a steroid sparing medicine. And that's where the other medicines are needed. Or they are on five milligram, but they're getting horrible side effects from steroids. Believe me, it does not happen. If you've like done things correctly, five milligram is a very well tolerated dose, but don't leave them on more than five milligram. Right. And then you can see here from this diagram, you add immunosuppression. If they're not responding at any point, always think, actually, am I missing infection or lymphoma? This always needs to go keep going in your mind, right? And that's why uveitis is, is a tricky uh, speciality. You need to always think and keep the door open for revising the diagnosis. Okay, so, uh, okay, well, another question is, okay, well, patients now well controlled, how long we should keep them on that treatment with all these poisons, right? So good question. So for all the disease I described in the beginning, like where I mentioned like Bechet, what do you say? Bechet, Birchall, Big H, Sympathetic Ophthalmia, um, uh, Ocular Cicatricial, Pemphigoid, those ones, Serpiginous, it's usually about 18 months to two years, and another entity is like for life. So you should not stop treatment in these conditions before they are in remission, so you start accounting from when they go into remission for 18 months to two years. Another view is like, keep them on all the medicines they are on, just leave them like this unless they're getting significant side effects and you know, don't trouble troubles and just leave it like this. So two views and I think you, and I tend to really go one way or the other depending on what the patient has, if it's their only remaining eye, right? How comfortable is the patient with treatment? What are the patient's thoughts? So I go from like, okay, two years after remission to, you know, you and I will become good friends for life and you just continue on the treatment for life. Okay. Right. Now I'll take you through the, the non-important parts now. Uh, no, this is still important. So effective drug, problem is side effects. We've talked about bone density. Uh, yeah, five milligram is the safe dose and special consideration in children because you can stun their growth with a steroid. That's why in children uveitis, stem steroids used very, very minimally, just a very short course for weeks really, rather than a month. And otherwise you try to avoid systemic steroids in kid. Lots and lots of regimen. This is one regimen here in the focal point I'm gonna pass to you. There's another regimen, all works, all fine. Okay. Now the coming bit is really not important. I just want you to take like a word on it. And I think the important is how the medicine work in, in case for exams or for you as a non uveitis specialist, just to know how the medicine works. And I'll tell you really the important bits here. Cyclosporin, very nice drug, T signaling inhibitor. The problem is most patients after the age of 60, they have um, bad kidney function. And this medicine is very cytotoxic is very kidney toxic. So that's the problem. That's why we don't use it very often. Okay, well, let's use it in kids. Problem in kids, they get hirsutism and then they get bullied in school saying, okay, you're very hairy and someone called this the gorilla syndrome. So you don't want to use that in children as well, except very cautiously. So I don't know if you, you like mnemonics, like I used to like that when I was in the uni. So hypertension, hirsutism, hepatotoxicity, and then you need to find an H for nephrotoxicity uh, and then there will be like 4-H and also like uh, I think they get gum swelling hypertrophy of the gum so that was another H as well and hypercholesterolemia so they were always H except the nephrotoxicity I wonder if we can some find something for the kidney with a H anyway uh, tacrolimus like you can think about like a modified version or like a, a, a better version of, of cyclosporin the side effects less. The problem is you have to monitor blood level with tacrolimus. Uh, with cyclosporin, I know you've seen books about monitoring blood level. You don't need to do that. It doesn't work. Okay, now let's go to the other group, methotrexate, adocyprin, mycophenolate. All that group, they have something in common, GI. And instead, the other one was a nephrotoxicity. This one is hepatotoxicity. And you can think about microfenolate, mofetil, or Celsep as like the cleanest version of them, right? They're all the same, bone marrow depression, GI, 
uh, hepatotic CT, but microphone is very nice, very well tolerated, and this is my favorite uh, drug. Uh, main side effect of it is some diarrhea in some patients. If you decrease the dose or go to the myofortic acid, it may, may stop. If it does not work, then you have to change the medicine, but it's very well tolerated. Okay, uh, let's not go through that. I mean, I'm not really interested in doses or anything, but I just want you to know. Uh, yeah, here there's a clever question. So how does methotrexate work? Okay, by inhibiting folic acid, right? No, wrong, because if it's inhibit folic acid as the immunosuppression uh, mechanism, then you're giving them folic acid every week so that you're like defeating the medicine. So it does not work through that way. It works through the other pathway like cell sept where it inhibits another pathway uh, and not inhibiting folic acid. So that's like something, you know, just uh, I'm sure many of you have thought about that. Okay. At the cyprin, uh, just for the sake of the exam, remember this thing about TPMT enzyme level, because if you don't have that enzyme, you have more side effects. I think it's more theoretical, but I don't use it very often. I think it's like a non, uh, I don't like it. I think it's more toxic than Celsep. And Celsep here, this is my favorite drug. And uh, it's a very nice medicine and it works so well, but you still have to monitor uh, liver enzymes because still patients can have re liver toxicity in some patients. Okay, so why microfinylate is the most favorable treatment? If you look at this data, which I collected from several studies, microfinylate was the least medication uh, stop and uh, was uh, much well tolerated, and even efficacy uh, is one of the best. Okay, red flags you have to monitor these patients you need to do blood tests right you need to monitor uh, liver function kidney function in general if you're going two to three uh, times uh, more than the upper limit of the reference range you're in trouble and that's why you have to have a way of looking at the blood to look at trends it's not like a one measure you have to look at trends and you find that most of the emr now they can show you all the blood tests next to each other like by time so you can monitor trend Okay, biologic, I just want to tell you two things. Humera, you have anti-TNF, right? We know how they uh, work against the anti-TNF antibodies. I'll show you, I'll tell you a few interesting bits here. There are two receptors for TNF. One is called P55 and one is called the P75. The one related to inflammation is the P55. The one related to homeostasis and lymphocytes, uh, maturation and um, is more of the P75. So the million dollar question is why etanercept does not work for uveitis. And you will see that. You see that you have patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, they get etanercept very nicely, but it does not prevent uveitis. Actually, it may activate uveitis. So remember that question for now. Okay, so anti-TNF, as you would imagine, immunosuppression, right? They actually, even the ones that are purely humanized, like Humira, they still can get antibodies and you can monitor the blood level. Of course, it's more if you have part of it as murine, like part from rats, right? Then if part of it is from rats, then you can get more antibodies, right? But even with the other ones, you still can get antibodies. Okay. Um, they also can cause activation of TB because of inhibition of immune mechanism. They may really uh, trigger MS. They may call cardiac insufficiency. So the rule is that before we start them, we have to test for TB. Okay. Anti-TNF, I think is important because it's FDA approved for adults and for kids, right? And you can give it monotherapy because it's 100% human but they still can get antibodies to it. While, he, uh, while um, rituximab, no, sorry, I've lost a slide on infliximab. While infliximab, you cannot give it alone because of like, there's a good part of it, murine, and they will 100% get antibodies. So usually it's an infusion and you cannot give it alone. Okay, so those are the anti-TNF ones, right? Is there a medicine that works on the B cell and depletes the B cell? Yes, rituximab. But usually it's a second line. So if you're starting to escalate, 
you go to the conventional immunosuppressor first, you go to the anti-TNF third, second, and then usually you go to rituximab because um, it will really, it's, it's a very effective treatment and usually it, it's that way in process. And it's a B20 inhibitor uh, on the uh, surface marker of the B cell and, um, and you will hear about it in the oculars where you really need, it works very quickly as well. So that's where you need quick action, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid and retinal vasculitis. Here is the question is why etanercep does not work and no one knows. Few thoughts. Maybe it works more again as the P75 antibody, which is re is not related much to inflammation, but it works in joint inflammation, right? And then other thoughts is that the bound the binding between etanercept and the TNF is not very strong. So every now and again, some TNF particles would fall off the etanercept and then will cause problems. These are all suggestions, but for some reason, it's not effective in uveitis. Okay, so let's go back to our lady here, Madame Fatakat, who is from London. And she has what we said, undifferentiated uh, uveitis, uh, site threatening or site involving. What are we gonna do? All right, we'll give her steroids, slowly taper to five milligram. We'll give her cell-sept because she keeps flaring up and we'll leave her on that. And once she's in remission, we'll start counting in two years or we'll say, uh, well, just let's leave it like this. Okay, uh, I just wanna tell you something. Sometimes even with best treatments and you can read up, up, up the treatment and you can find that because I just been saying this because, and, uh, because Madame Fatakat has macular edema. So sometimes it just doesn't work and they are really quiet, but they have persistent macular edema. That's where you need to add local treatment. And that will I'll take you to my second slide after some uh, time for discussion. Dr. al Amri, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad, for this uh, excellent presentation and symbol also, you symbolize and uh, the- Especially management. the diagram that I showed, right? The diagram, that one, there will be a question about that. We have to make a vote and about this one. Uh, we, I cannot uh, assure you about that one. But I think it's very um, nice as usual, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much. Really appreciate this uh, symbol well, and you. very nice. And also in on time for the presentation regarding the management. I know it's a very big uh, topic that we can take yeah, a lot I, I have a few slides on local treatment. So I, can I have 10 minutes more, but I thought yes, we stop for yes, this. Yes. Okay. No, no, it's okay. It's uh, great. Yeah. If you are okay, you can go ahead. Shall we take some more questions? Like just to break down, like, what, what do you think? Uh, take some questions. I, go back, there is any, I didn't receive any questions, but if you want me to ask you, um, yeah. Uh, Humira, it's it's it take a long. Uh, I mean, uh, a lot of propaganda as a very good medication. I I'm I'm not saying I'm not against, but I'm I want you to highlight about that one, how effective in in management. Uh, uh, you know, it's because it's a latest medication that we know about it in uh, related. Which one? To, uh, Which one? Humira. Oh, uh, Humira. Yeah, Humira is very effective. It's a very good medicine. It's very effective. Side effects are rare, but still it's, uh, you know, yeah. One thing I I forget to say, so if, if anti-TNF is so good, right, especially Humira, why don't we just start with Humira, right? Why do we need to go to the This is the cell? my second. I ask you to ask you this question because you say you don't okay. want to start. That's my yeah. question because I highlight about this point here. Yeah, there are two reasons. The first or the actually the second one is an expensive medicine. But the first one, there is concern about immunosuppression from anti-TNF in particular and cancer. So we know that immunosuppression, it interferes with all the surveillance mechanisms for cancer prophylaxis that we have. I mean, subhanAllah, you know, our immunity is working well. It's like filtering bad cells. If you immunosuppress, you can get cancer. This has been seen with conventional immunotherapy, immunosuppression like methotrexate, but it's a very, very small risk, but the risk is high if you're an anti-TNF. And that's why we, it needs to be spared as a second line agent. 
organic MS. Yeah, and in addition to the MS, it, it can reactivate MS or uncover MS, but also the cancer is the main one. It's more cancer than a conventional immunosuppression like mesotrexate and sunset. But I'm talking about MS. It can reactivate what is available or it can... It I can mean, reactivate or uncover MS, yes, because it interferes with the, in, the main immune mechanism that is... Um, I, can't, I can't remember really the exact why, but it's... Uh, yeah, I can't remember. It's something, again, is the myelin that happens really the, with the cells. Like, uh, yeah, I can't remember why, but it... it either reactivates or uncovers MS. Okay, there is one question from Dr. Uh, Abdul Majid Barakat. Are there is any bio, uh, biomedical markers to start tapering of prednisolone? So what are the, the things that we can depend on doing? It's a clinical or there is a bio, uh, biochemical markers? So that's a good question. So biochemical markers, no, but there are like, you know, imaging markers, for example, you know, that everything is getting better, the vitreous haze is getting better, or like uveitis markers. There's imaging markers in terms of the macro edema, in terms of also the choroidal blood flow is normalizing. So these are all imaging markers. Blood markers, uh, no, but something that people looked at before uh, is the T lymphocyte suppression on the blood test. If your lymphocytes go down to 0.6, so it's really like significantly down, that's what you want to be like a 0.6, but that's usually with immunosuppression more. You look at the level of the lymphocyte and it needs to go down to 0.6, usually it's about 1.2. So 0.6 is like really half of it. This is like you know that this patient, the medicines are immunosuppressing them, but this is really not very accurate. I think you're looking at overall the um, the response to treatment. The question is maybe an extension to that question: is, Are there any biomarkers where we find them? We say, okay, actually, this patient, so the patient Muhammad with this disease, actually may be better treated with cyclosporin and the sunset. And so far, no, we don't have that as well. So it depends on the uh, I mean, clinical judgment of the uh, specialized. Yes. Uh, okay. uh, the second question, how many times would, would it be safe to inject Illuvian or other decks in vitrectomized eyes? That's a great question, Ri. I don't think anyone knows the answer for this. I know you know that for sure. And maybe, maybe we'll address that uh, in this uh, presentation. So I can get the presentation ready as we speak. Uh, I don't think no one knows the answer, but I think as long as there are no side effects, particularly high pressure, you can keep going unless it's needed. Again, an extension of that question, and I really don't know the answer, is we know from anti-VEGF when you go for a PRN, this is not very good because you're allowing tissues to fail, right? Same applies for uveitis. If you go for PRN, that's really not very good as well. So you may want to like repeat them around the clock then PRN or maybe do an extend, like um, what's the word, treat and extend more for repeating this medicine in uveitis because every time it fails, you start from the beginning, you lose something. So that's really, you know, that's an important point. But usually is as long as there are no side effects, you keep going. Uh, I think that's uh, all, Dr. Ahmed, for the systemic, if you okay. want to go. Let me actually... Just give me one second. I want to connect my uh, my laptop because it will go to sleep. Okay. Dr. Dibak, also, if you have any questions, I know you aren't here, Sigma, but I know everyone is involved with all these uh, diseases. Yeah, if you have sure. any comment or questions, please. Definitely. Sir. I think the first slide itself was... Uh, Exemplary, you know, the, when, when Dr. Ahmed started, you know, it, it literally brings on all the points together and uh, a great learning experience, I must say. And I have taken a screenshot of the same. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, well, we, we will send, yeah, we I'll will send you that. the focal point. I actually have a better diagram of it in the focal point, more colorful. So I'll send that to you, Dr. Deepak. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Sorry, thank you so much we moved the houses, so I don't Yeah, we will download in the YouTube, then you can find anyone, uh, then later on can just uh, have it uh, or download it from there. Dr. <clears throat> Ahmed, you lost or we lost you or you are still connecting the, <laughs> the laptop? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll... Uh... Uh, good, Dr. Ahmad, that we are not in the conference, but please not in the conference, huh? Like an ace of No, I'm just... Uh... <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me just share the second presentation here. Um, Okay. So, so this is a great study. It's called the must. Uh, the screen is not shared yet, Dr. Ahmad. I'm not sure then. what's happening with. Okay, now it's okay. You can see. Very nice. Okay. Everything is good. Okay, so this MUST trial is really a very important study in uveitis. They looked at, so um, multicenter uveitis uh, trial looked at systemic treatment versus intravitreal therapy with retisert, which delivers flucidone acetonide. And the question is, are they equal for non-infectious uveitis? And the initial study and the three years extension showed something very interesting. They were equal in uveitis reactivation and they were equal in the visual acuity, which is really nice. And it goes what we always thought is that this is a cookery. You can treat it this way or other way. Uh, and it's all preference on what you have, right? But then at five years, they did uh, a look at, okay, patients with uveitic macular edema, did they respond better to systemic treatment or intravitreal therapy? And they found actually what you would expect, intravitreal therapy. But then they did something very clever at seven years, which was actually the study finished, right? And they did a retrospective extension of the study where they looked at patients that were enrolled in the study and look what happened to them. And they found something very interesting. They found that systemic patients who were on systemic treatment, they did much better. And if I can leave you to think about this for 30 seconds, as I just need to, to sort out my laptop because it's gonna go. So give me, sorry, 30 seconds. But I want you to, to think about this. Why after seven years, the patient on systemic treatment did better than the retiserve, although at one year and three years, they were doing all the same.
Okay. Success. We found a charger. Uh, the, the reason is that, uh, do you have any, any comments from the audience, Dr. Muhammad, about the reason? No, if you want my opinion, I can give you, and I think yes, I will be wrong. Go ahead. Yes, yes. I know it will be wrong, but it's okay. Let's, uh, no, you know, no. let's, um, maybe I was thinking maybe the systemic, they will have more uh, available of the medicine in the system more longer than it will be in the intravitreal. I think this is what it uh, came absolutely, to my mind. Absolutely, absolutely. This is so, re this is exactly what happened. And that's why, and I think this is the beauty of this study. Re it like tells you exactly what's happening in uveitis. So patient with reticert, the reticert, as I'm going to show you later on, and maybe actually we can show you now to keep connecting things together. The reticert is this implant here. Here, this is an implant that we suture uh, to the through the pars plana, and it lasts for about 30 months, and it releases uh, flucetin and acetone. And this is like a bomb in the eye, where you actually have 90% chance for cataract surgery, 40% glaucoma surgery, in addition to hypotony infection and implant displacement. The implant is very cheap, $20,000, and uh, it lasts for three years. Yes. But does it really last for three years? We don't know, because it may last longer. Why we right. are using this one instead of doing, I mean, uh, Illuvian, which is less price, and it's give to this is a, another yes. great question. Fantastic question. And I'm ready for that. Because if you look, the Illuvin is about 20 milligram, but the Reticert is 0.56 milligram. So if you're thinking it's one Reticert is equals three Illuvin. And that's why the Illuvin does not work so well. So this really is fantastic, works well. But the thing is, it's a surgery. It's a very expensive implant and even insurance at many points, try not to cover it and uh, its side effects. And that led to under treatment in the patients uh, of the MUST trial, where there were patients who did not have retreatment because of this thing. Does it work for three years? Does it work for five years? Shall we treat it if the infection flares up? Shall we wait if, uh, or shall we like retreat around the clock, right? So that, How about that, the other decks? I mean, you as you live in, then top up other decks every now and then. Don't you think we will sure, have sure. A, a high well, these medicines, a high dose? These medicines are great, but they have the same problem we were mentioning, is that this called the seesaw effect. They improve, goes down, you fail, treat again, fail, treat again. And every time you drop down, you don't start from the same point. You start from a lower point. So what about why you continuous giving every four months, for example, other days, for example? Don't you think it will be, um, I mean, one illusion? This is just um, a, a speculation. Yeah, yeah, no, this is great for discussion. Yeah, I mean, you are giving illusion. Then after now, every four months, you are giving or six months uh, top up. So it will be, maybe the cost, it will be the same. But uh, the complication that I saw with this, um, uh, subconjunctiva, uh, I don't know, subconjunctiva, or within sclera, it's it's um, it's more, yani, or less. Uh, I think even for regarding the uh, intraocular pressures, it will be less in comparison to this. Uh, I, I agree. I think it's uh, it's you know, I think, and again, it's like a cookery. But what I want to really to take you through is, you know, I just want to take you through like the overall you know, the overall uh, or overarching philosophy in treating uveitis. I think this is the main aim of this lecture, really. So I totally agree, but I just wanted to understand, really, both work so well. There's problem with the local treatment that it's hard to obtain. You don't know what's the end point. You don't know what, when you repeat. Uh, even the, the problem with dexamethasone and Illuvin is that they do, dexamethasone works well, but it's short-lived. Illuvin uh, works okay. It's not as effective, really. And the problem is short-lived as well. Okay, shall we treat patient when they fail, like PRN, or do I treat and extend, or do around the clock? That's one of the problem in uveitis treatment. And I think that's really what I wanted you to get to. 
I'll give you some nice, um, um, yeah, let, let's go through the remaining parts of the presentation quickly, and then I'll summarize to you. Okay. So, okay, so we talked about the must study, we call it one year, three year, five year for CME and seven year extension, and we know what happened, right? This is a list of treatments. So the question is, you have uveitic macular edema. Um, what, let's, long, let's just give them orbital floor injection, right? Or subtenin. That study was looked at by a pi, something called the point study. And that's what they found. They found that periocular treatment works well, right? But um, the main, that works well, periocular treatment, um, uh, but it's better if you give intravitreal, you have better vision. And also if you give other decks, it's comparable to intravitreal canelone, but the side effects tend to be less. As you would expect here, this is the intraocular, intraocular pressure. And you can see here, periocular uh, treatment was lower in pressure rise compared to eyes with dexamethasone uh, implant or canelone. And that's something we know and we expect, right? So we know that periocular injections or subtenin is soft core. It's not as hard and not as very effective as intravitreal therapy. That's something we go in from this trial. Okay, intravitreal canelog, we have triessence in the US, which is FDA approved. Uh, you, it works well. Uh, it's a good treatment. Uh, it works well for cystoid macular edema, but the problem is the side effects. And we looked at that. And of course, the more you give, the more you get side effects, right? And we found that, okay, you go up to even 50 or 60% high pressure rise with repeat treatment. The problem really with intravitreal cantaloupe is uh, the pseudoendothelmitis, which can go up even to 10%. And here, this is from one study we did, and we found, of course, you have like 100% cataract if you're doing repeat injections. And uh, pressure rise, it, again, it's, uh, uh, it's a problem really with the intravitreal canalog as we discussed. Okay, this is a patient, does this patient have hypopion or this is pseudo hypopion? You can see there are crystals, it's heaped up. The eye is not very inflamed. So that was, this was one of my patients. And this patient had pseudo hypopion from intravitreal canalog. Okay. Now you the Ozirdex, and I think Ozirdex is a nice, you know, pure. I, I think of it as the purified version that lasts longer, even in vitrectomized eyes in patient who has um, uveitis. So it's like canalog, but better version and lasts longer. And we know it works, right? But again, the problem is the side effect. If you want to remember a number. We said like 50% pressure rise with canalog. Here is 30% pressure rise. Okay, and that's how canalog looks like. Uh, sorry, how Ozodex looks like. And we looked at like multiple treatment. And again, the same thing, pre pressure rise problems. Uh, if you're giving multiple Ozodex becomes a problem. And then we talked about reticer. Illuvin, Illuvin is very good, but it's not as effective as reticer. Okay, what's the pressure rise in the Leuven? We said 30% in Ozerdex and 1% uh, glaucoma surgery. Here, it's about 40% pressure rise and about 4% glaucoma surgery. So 30% and 1%, 40% and 4%. And with the Retisert, uh, it's 80% pressure rise and 40% uh, glaucoma surgery. So it just means like as you escalate with the potency of the steroids, your side effects increases. Okay, what about other medications, especially for patients who are steroid responders with high pressure? Mesotrexate. Mesotrexate is an interesting medicine. It does not work very well. Uh, there was one study from Morphus that shows it works well for vitreous haze and macular edema, but in reality, it does not work very well. So, uh, it's a cheap medicine, it's available. It does not trace the eye pressure as an advantage, but it just doesn't work very well. Does anti-VEGF work? No, not for uveitis. And you can expect that, right? It works very little because there are multiple mechanisms really to code for uveitis. It's not only the VEGF. 
and you need something there which is more like has steroid effect. And that's one study here where they con, con, uh, con, uh, compared uh, a bevacizumab, a bastin versus intravitreal trimicinone, and they found really it doesn't work so well. Maybe even it's uh, and even it's like below the subtenone steroid. So there's no much point in using it, but it does not uh, raise the pressure. Does infliximab work? Infliximab as an intravitreal treatment? No, no, it causes severe panuveitis. But now there are people are using Humira for intravitreal treatment as off-label, but not infliximab. Now, this is the new thing. It's called Zyper, Zyper, Zyper I think Zyper, uh, and uh, it's a supracoroidal kinologue. And the advantage, if you put it in the supracoroidal space, it lasts longer because it's a, in a, like a localized space. The other thing is hidden from the trabecular meshwork, so it does not raise the pressure. So they found in the PEACH trial that it, one injection lasted for about four months, and the pressure rise, remember we said 30% was Ozerdex, 40% was Illuvin, 80% was Retisir. Here it's about 11%. If you're not like a rounded number, 10%. So this there's a role for this. It's uh, it's still expensive because of the pharmacy really just providing the needles uh, and the medicine uh, exclusively by that pharmacy, um, by that industry industrial company. So it is expensive if you want the real the real version. Uh, it's difficult to administer uh, to make sure it's in the supracroidal space, but it has less side effects and the rationale is is there that it's uh, hidden from the trabecular meshwork. Uh, okay, so I mean, what I really want to come to is again, I think the overarching philosophy of treating uveitis. And I think I'd like to finish re by looking at this must study again, like what we discussed, and that you can treat patient this way or that way, but you just need to understand what's happening and, uh, Everything has a risk, but again, there's also the risk of losing vision from uveitis. The prevalence of uveitis is 1%, but it's responsible for 10% of visual loss. So it's a, it's a blinding disease. And thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Really, it's a very interesting. All the time listening to you and learning from you is really a great. and. You make the things very easy, very simple. Thank you so much. You're and so kind. I'd like, yeah. Uh, uh, this is not my opinion. Everyone is, uh, I think, have this opinion. Uh, it was very nice. Um, and you give everything in a very nice. We didn't receive any questions. And I think it will be um, a great to conclude if you have any last just message about this one. Because most of the time, when you are talking about steroid, it's uh, a big problem. I mean, but it's a a, a very important medicine that we are using and we have to use uh, um, whatever. And it's a very a great, I mean, medicine, even systemic or topical or intravitreal. Uh, and um, we need to be, I mean, eager to do and benefit the patient. And I think we have to make a, a comparison between benefits and side effect. But at the end, sometimes there is no other options and you have to go for that. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, and I think really, um, I think in uveitis, you have to treat the uveitis first, then second deal with the side effects. But you need to, I think the problem happens that we don't explain to patients well. But if you tell them, look, it's you're going to get blind, really. So it's better to not get blind and maybe have high pressure that, yes, can make you blind, but is treatable with surgery then don't do anything because we're worried about the high pressure and you're going to get blind 100%. So I think you have you need to have that discussion with patients and also like understand we just briefly, you know, the pros and cons of every management line and what happens and why this is so and why this patient gets treated with this. And again, I think that's what I tried to cover in this uh, lecture. It's just like, okay, try to connect the dots uh, between the different lines of treatments. 
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, Dr. Dibak, if you want to say something before we conclude. Yeah, uh, thanks again. It was a learning experience for me as well, uh, despite being an NDA segment guy, a cornea person. But uh, definitely, as Dr. Amri told, that we tend to see all mixed specialities you know, kind of patients. The, the only stint I had with Ozotex was... Uh, uh, one patient was referred to me for anterior dislocation of the implant into the AC leading to corneal edema, which was not responding. And so I had to finally do a DSEC for the patient but and remove the implant. But the patient did well. So that was my experience with uh, Ozodex, uh, so-called an inadvertent complication handling. So, But I think uh, it's, uh, it's uh, definitely a good treatment to control the UIT. Absolutely. That patient, doctor, uh, just to be sure, if there is a capsule ruptures or there is, because it will not come out unless there is something, you know. Yeah, yeah. There was uh, during the surgery, the primary surgeon did the cataract surgery. And then during the surgery, he had a PCR. Then he implanted the Ozodex as well. And then many months later, the Ozodex came in front as per the surgeon. But uh, he probably waited for some time that, okay, fine. Because it was a localized inferior edema. But it was not responding, so the haze just persisted, leading, leading to a kind of an inferior scarring. So then, uh, for the opinion, when the patient came, I suggested that better to go ahead with the DSEG. Otherwise, if more scarring will be there, then DM scoring would become difficult in such cases because the edema was persisting. So in the same sitting, we removed the Ozodex implant and... Uh, Leaving that scarred area, I did a smaller desmetorexis and uh, the patient is doing well now. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, information, Dr. Dibak again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, before we conclude, just I would like to announce that we are going to have the conference. It's not announcement. It's just to remind our colleagues that next week, 14 to 16, we'll have a big conference, fourth uh, MIOM conference. And we will have also a pleasure to have Dr. Ahmed and give us a pleasure and honor to be with us in this conference in Dubai next week, Friday and Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and those, anyone of these attendees, they didn't register or didn't find any sponsoring, they can just send their email to me. And anyone who attend this meeting today, it will be a free registration. Uh, and we hope to meet you all soon, inshallah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you, Dibak, and thank you for the uh, management here and for all the uh, attendees. And uh, regarding also the certificate, they will send you after the, this meeting or maybe it will be after the conference. Um, because they didn't arrange this time the actually the link for the certificate, but they will do it and they send it later on, inshallah. Um, thank you very much. And we hope to see you soon, inshallah. Thank you. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. See you. See you soon. Bye bye. bye, -bye. To Salam, Dr. Ahmed. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much. Goodbye. See you. Bye-bye. Uh, good night, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.